If I do an open embryo adoption, just how does the ODA, Open Donation Agreement, work? Also, why do adopting NEDC families need to have their home studies reviewed? We are diving into those questions today on the Embryo Adoption Podcast. I'm your host, Mark Mellinger, and I'm joined by the ladies who handle these duties for us at the National Embryo Donation Center, Lauren Wilson and Amy Ferguson from our partners at Flourish Consulting, LLC. So Lauren, I want to start with you. Explain what an open donation agreement is and how it's mediated. Sure. So an open donation agreement is needed because when you choose an open donor, your donor actually will initially approve you as the recipient couple. So um, it's different than an anonymous donor match in that they get the chance to find the best match for both parties. So the agreement is set in place so that the donors can officially release their embryos to this recipient couple directly. And it's also a way for um, them both to make a future, I like to call it an outline of future contact maybe because when you choose open, um, that it's hard to really truly define what that will be for 18 years, you know, through your child's life. So that's kind of the baseline for what it's there for. And, and I want to follow up on that. Amy, how set in stone is it when you come up with this written document, this open donation agreement? Are these documents flexible at all? Well, we always say is that it is a legal document. So, you know, we do, it's, um, you know, meant to kind of be set in stone, but there can be flexibility depending on how well you get along. And Lauren does work with both parties separately. So it really is a mutually agreed upon document. Um, in the future, if couples wanted things to be changed, we would advise that a lawyer get involved just so that it's legally updated. Um, but it is pretty much set in stone. Sometimes though, Lauren will pick perfect, I mean, she'll pick the most perfect wording possible to allow some flexibility for the couples if that's what they desire. And she'll put more firm wording in if it wants to be a little bit more hardcore. But Lauren, intervene here and speak yeah. up. Yeah, the, the saying I give usually is you can always do above and beyond what you say you want on the contract. You just can't do less. So mm -hmm. if you say, okay, we will email, we, the recipient couple, will email our donors once a year with a picture and a little update that will be written on the contract. So you will say, yes, we in good faith agree to do this, right? But if they really get along great and they say, mm -hmm. hey, we really want to send them an extra update this year, you, you can. You can always do more on your own. Again, just kind of mutually go through that. And so you don't, you wouldn't need to, uh, amend your contract in that case. Anything more you can just do on your own. Because um, I really advise all the clients I work with, you know, I don't want you to feel like this, this is a contract and you must abide by this. This is your relationship. Because all of us have probably been on, I use the example of going on a first date with people. When you go on a first date, do you want that person to look at you and say, let's sign a prenuptial agreement now for a marriage mm. when you don't know them? It's a joke, you know, it's kind of a silly example, but it is kind of what this is in some ways. It's meeting people you really don't know. So you really don't know how well you're going to get along. So the contract's there to help set healthy expectations. The expectation's the key word. And then, um, how your relationship develops, my hope when I work with everybody is I want you all to let it flow organically. Let it just become naturally what it's going to be based on your personalities, how far you live from each other, how well you get along. And then ultimately, when your child starts getting older, they will get to voice as well how they want that relationship. Yeah. But it does kind of set the minimum requirements, right, Lauren? Like exactly. you have to agree to at least the minimum on the contract. Exactly. Yeah. So Lauren, about how long does it generally take to mediate w one of these? I think that's important for yeah. people who are going through the NEDC to know about how much does it cost? What exactly does that cost cover? Yeah. Can you walk us through that? Sure. So when you go, 
you'll get to a set time where you get to, to match with your embryos and your donor will have to have an initial approval of you when you choose them. So once they initially approve you as a recipient, then they'll come to me and I start reaching out to everybody. So from that moment, the average time frame is six weeks. I always say is a good healthy time frame. And the reason it takes six weeks um, is really because donors respond at their own pace. And I can't pressure a donor to respond to my email that day. So we are kind of sometimes some donors respond quicker, sometimes others don't. Most often people have to match with multiple donors as well. So that means that's just a little extra time. And, um, but I do most of the work as far as contacting everyone, you know, I'm kind of, I'm mediating. So I'm, I'm chatting with everyone separately. And so, yeah, I would say that's a good ha average time. Some people have gone shorter, some people have gone longer. How much does it cost and how many agreements does it cover? And the reason I ask that, you, you know the reason I ask that, but to the people listening, the reason I ask that, if you're not intimately familiar with the NEDC process, we like you to have, we recommend that you have usually a handful, half a dozen embryos ready to go, as it were, for your transfer yeah. so nobody mm -hmm. comes to Knoxville and is unable to have a transfer. It's exactly. never happened in the history of the NEDC. Uh, yeah. It's one thing that gives people peace of mind in some cases mm -hmm. about going with us. You know you'll have a transfer, but sometimes that means you're going to have, if you're going open, you're going to have to work out an ODA with not just one, but two families, right, Lauren? Possibly, yeah. Sometimes three, some have done that because you want to have on average five, sometimes six embryos available for your first, you know, for your transfer attempt. So yeah, that may mean, uh, you know, some donors only have two embryos, some donors only have one, some have six, some have 10. Mm -hmm. So you, you have a wide range of different types of numbers of embryos you're choosing from. So yes, I will individually do an agreement with each separate donor. And so the cost is... Um, 1,785. So what that covers, that covers your full mediation services, and it also includes support services ongoing through your transfer, even if you have multiple transfers. So it's not just time limited, thankfully. And a lot of times I continue mediation with your backup donors. If you choose two or three, those are your backup donors, and you may not want to email them yet or have contact if you don't implant their embryos, but you want to reserve them. So a lot of my work is kind of ongoing and more long term. So that one fee will cover up to two donor matches. So if you match with two separate donors, that's included. If you do match with more than one, you know, more than two, there is an additional fee of 470 per donor as well. But again, that includes the full services to them. And we provide support to the donor as well separately if they need support sessions. Um, so it's kind of a full service. Uh, process. Yeah, it's, it's, no, that that's great. R really helpful and very practical for folks who are thinking about walking this road. Amy, what are some things that can potentially sideline a, a potential mm -hmm. ODA and indicate it's time for a recipient couple to look in another direction? Sure. So they do have to get approval from the donors, and that's where Krista kind of steps in at the NEDC. So one way that things could maybe slow down or potentially some hiccups could happen is if the donors, for whatever reason, don't approve this couple. Now, you guys can probably speak more to this. I don't think that happens very often, but it does happen. So that could put a family back into the matching process if they didn't have, you know, some backup ones in mind. Um, like Lauren mentioned earlier, another way it could slow down is if just people are busy, right? Life happens. These donors have kids. They're doing swim lessons. They're going to baseball practices. So if this isn't necessarily maybe on their top priority, you know, on their calendar agendas, things could slow down for them too. They do want their embryos adopted though. So they really do have a good motivation and desire for this to happen for couples. They were, you know, infertile as well. So they understand that desire to move quickly and to have that earnest movement. So those are a couple. Lauren, do you have any other um, ideas of when things can slow down during ODA? Yeah, um, one thing, uh, some of the delays will sometimes happen when, you know, when I start chatting, you know, I really spend a lot of time with the donor talking, and I also do the same with the recipient couples. I do, I spend as much time with them. I like to get to know them. I really mm -hmm. take mediations really seriously because 
I'm thinking ahead of your future child. I'm really, I feel like we sometimes are the voice of these future children, right? We're the voice of the mm -hmm. embryos, but we're also a voice of a future child being born. And so I want to make sure when I'm chatting with both parties that, that not only do they agree on their preferences, but they both, I believe that they would get along well too in some way. So it's almost mm -hmm. like reading personalities even too. And I try to be very direct and open with people about who, who's gonna match up well. There are cases, and this is you know a small percentage maybe of my mediations, under 10% where either party just doesn't match. They, they, they have a different view of what their openness will be. And I try to assure people that may feel disappointing in the moment, but honestly, it's a better thing for your long-term future. It's like, go again, going on a first date, you're not going to marry necessarily the first person you meet on your dating life. It's, it's very similar to that. Um, so yeah, some will... Um, some will have to choose a different donor based on that. Some recipient couples will turn a donor down after I've worked some with them. I mean, and I always say that's so that is okay. Ultimately, we want everyone to find the best match for them. So how are they finding out about each other? You know, I've worked here for a long time and I've never really um, just taken a deep dive into this process. How are they finding out about each other during this time? Is it like you ladies are talking with one half of the equation and getting to know them a little bit, and then you're sort of sharing in a non-identifying way some basic information with either either the donor or recipient couple, the other half of the match, and you're sort of paraphrasing their yeah. their feelings. Is that how it works? Pretty much. I mean, yeah, it's really, I, I write basically a, a, an email book report on this couple, and it is confidential, of course. Um, some people are fine with me sharing some of their information early. Some choose to share their full names. Um, they typically don't share an email or contact info, though. Most people will wait to share that. But yeah, I write up kind of a story. I put myself in the shoes of the recipient couple when I'm speaking with a donor. I think, gosh, if I was going to parent a child one day of embryo adoption, what would I want to know? Right. And so I really do get a lot more detailed information from them on their medical history. I get more information on their children and on their infertility journey um, that way the recipient couple really gets a good feeling and I'll do the same I'll share a little more details whatever the recipient cu couple is comfortable with me sharing again I don't do anything without either party's permission but yeah I kind of go back and forth and share a little bit about who each other are and then some people have specific questions and I'll forward those questions and they'll answer those too so it's lots of various ways a neat piece too is when the donors get really excited to share about their kiddos at home. And because we all like to brag about our kids, right? What are they doing well in? What sports are they playing? And then that's always a sweet spot to share with the adoptive couples too. Like, hey, their genetic siblings are, you know, playing baseball and loving it. They're, you know, a beautiful singer. They're in piano lessons. Those are fun connection points too, where the adoptive couple can maybe potentially see what their kiddo may be interested in as well. Amy, obviously everything about the potential recipients may not be the potential donor's preference and vice versa. Like if for instance would be, oh, maybe this couple is taller than we had in mind, or maybe this couple mm -hmm. is shorter than we had in mind. That's just an example. There are a thousand sure. other things. So that said, how flexible would you advise each side to be going into these relationships? Yeah, so I do most of my work with the adoptive parents. So Lauren can speak about with the donors. Um, what we always say with the adoptive parents is it's really going to be overwhelming when you look at the database. And so if you can pray about it as a couple together at home, what are some areas that are really important to us? We don't want to get too picky where there's no perfect match, right? But if you have a few set things in mind that can just help you navigate the matching process, it'll just help you narrow down your selection a little bit more. So things 
I advise them are, um, are there certain medical issues or medical histories that you are comfortable with or that you're not comfortable with? And there's no shame, right? We wanna feel comfortable as much as possible going into this. Um, is education background really important to you? Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. What about um, just, history of um, where they grew up is that important to you occupation um, is their faith background important to you is it um, important for you that the family does it matter to you that they used an egg donor or a sperm donor is that a hit or a miss for them so there are some bigger areas that couples can have stronger feelings on and then some couples like we've heard the stories you know NEDC has been on the news and um, we just want an embryo that's hard to adopt we want to look at your special selection embryos we want to look at them and see where we can best fit or we just want to look at profiles that have you know 10 or more embryos in each profile they may have like different guidelines like that but if they can have a few pieces that can help calm things down and not be so overwhelming. Mm -hmm. um, race can also be an important factor for our couples of color um, that can narrow things down as well. And so we do work with them to try to find a good match for them if they desire that similarity. Um, but that's usually kind of our starting point. And then couples will ask more questions if they feel like they need help in the search. Lauren, what are reasons that people go open? I mean, obviously at the NEDC, we let you choose whether you go open or closed. Mm -hmm. Obviously, as you're hearing from this podcast, it's more involved if you go open. It's going to take mm -hmm. a little longer and you're going to probably add six weeks to your journey or so sure. um, because you ladies are dealing with so many of these uh, at any given time. What are good reasons that couples give for why they do go open and, and same, not just on the adopting side, but the donor mm -hmm. side, what, what is the, the value that, that those yeah. who go open see in it? Sure. Um, for the most part, a majority of them are coming at it from a very child centered view. They are thinking ahead of their child. They are thinking of you know, I really want a way for my child to have access to their genetic donors if they desire that. Not all, chil not all children choose to have a very wide open relationship with their a donor. They don't necessarily all want that. But studies have shown that majority, 80 to 90 percent, I mean, there's high numbers of children who were born from the past of an anonymous donor are now speaking as adults saying they do wish they had access and it's not they're not trying to necessarily be best friends right. with their donors um, but they just wish they had known wish they had an ability an easier way to find them i guess so most of my open donor or open mediations the adoptive couple will say you know we want it to have this available to our child, they also want an ability for the child to know their genetic siblings, to know where they live, a general location that's important. Um, and a lot of them just see it as a extended family to them. They want to honor those donors. You know, there's a, a big piece of these donors are giving an incredible gift. And so they feel they want to honor that by allowing this open relationship to celebrate this miracle of, of adoption and to allow a future relationship. So that's really what we see. Um, but there are a lot, there is a lot of information now online and a lot of professional organizations, a lot of adoption agencies are highly encouraging open adoption. So it is kind of out there as well. It's becoming more commonplace. So I think that's a lot of the reason too. Yeah, we certainly do advise our couples whether they go open or close. There's really no such thing anymore as truly closed adoption with the DNA Correct. services, 23andMe and Ancestry.com. I mean, when your child turns 18, uh, he or she will almost certainly be able to look up their genetic origins. And that's just really important for everybody mm -hmm. to know. Transparency is a is a big gift and it's vital. So thank sure. you for, for speaking to that. that. That's absolutely true. I want to uh, talk about <laughs> the other thing that you ladies do in connection with the NEDC. And, and that's the home study review. 
Lauren, why do our NEDC families need to go through those? They probably, I, I know they always feel like, geez, this home study was <laughs> such a big journey and now I have to have it reviewed. I, have, I I'm I not know. a They're yet. very scared. <laughs> <laughs> Not another thing to do. And I get that. I totally get that. I'm sure it's a little quite annoying to some couples. <laughs> um, but I'll just be honest. I've worked in, in you know, tr the traditional adoption field for a, a long time. I don't want to give a number, but it's a long time. And every agency in every different state has different ways they write home studies and every state has different legal requirements and what needs to be in there. So honestly, it's someone has to kind of be the clearing house to make sure it was done within adequate reason, which means not sadly, not all organizations do a great job. And I hate to say that, but they just don't. Some organizations will not check something as vital, I think, as the sex offender registry. I think that's a right. no-brainer. You got to check the sex offender registry for anyone. And there's some agencies that don't. And, you know, for the most part, you know, Amy, how you approve what percentage of all the home studies are really approved? It's a high percentage. It's like 98%, really. Yeah. It's, it's so high. Yeah. And we do everything we can to get you approved. We're not looking to not approve people. Um, and, you know, after we work a little bit with the agency, we get everything we need, right? So we don't say, sorry, your home study is not going to work, right? We work with them. We get what we need. We get notarized signatures. We get add addendums. Um, we get what we need to help this family move forward. What are some red flags, Amy, that would cause a recipient family to need some extra evaluation like you're talking about before the approval of a home study? I, I guess Lauren brought up a good one that, you know, if, if for whatever yeah. reason, the uh, adoption agency is not making somebody go through, go through like an FBI background check, right. criminal background check, or they're not uh, being uh, checked against the uh, sexual abuser registry. Well, mm -hmm. right. Those are obvious things that need to be right. done. A anything else? Yeah, you know, we require medical checks, like physical annual wellness checks. We want to make sure doctors are confident in their ability to parent a young child. Um, we also require if they have children in the home, the children to be interviewed. How do the children feel about adding another sibling to their family? Um, we also require uh, mental health letters. If you're seeking mental health counseling, Lauren and I view counseling as such a strong attribute for a family. If they're seeking counseling, we just need confirmation from their provider. How are they doing? Are they meeting their goals? Goals. Do you feel confident in their ability to parent? Um, what are some other, some maybe hiccups that we encounter is if you have a background check that came through, like maybe you got a DUI 15 years ago. We're going to have to like talk about that a little bit. Let's see what happened there. What were those circumstances? Um, you know, some teenage ladies, right? It's always the ladies. Maybe they did some shoplifting when they were a preteen. Let's make sure that's still not a habit anymore. Um, things like that. Just little red flags, right? Um, we need letters from their employer that they're actually making the money that they stated they are, um, making sure their finances are in order. Do they have um, enough money to add another child into the home? We're not saying you need to be millionaires, right? But we just want to make sure that you're able to pay your bills and can add another child into your home. What are some other things that might slow you down? Just other little things like we want to make sure you have a vehicle to drive around, make sure you have reliable transportation. Are the kids going to school? Are they seeing their doctors? Um, really just kind of basic things. But when things are look a little bit different, if there are a little bit of red flags, we still work with the family. We're not going to say like, hey, this isn't going to cut it. We do everything we can to just kind of sit them through it. We just have to slow it down a little bit because we are, like Lauren said, the voice of the child. One thing that people have asked me uh, a pretty good amount going into this is, well, what if we're in transition housing? Like we're moving from one house to another and we're just in a trailer right now. Or, you know, we just moved to a new city, so we're in, in an apartment. Um, is Am I still going to be able to get a home study and get it reviewed and cleared? Lauren, what would you say to somebody in that situation? Because honestly, I, I can over the years, I've talked to a lot of people on the phone yeah. who've asked me just that question. Sure. And that's common. I mean, when I worked in traditional adoption, we would have couples that would move. And in most all states, if you've had a home study done and you've moved, you know, it's a home study. <laughs> so it's 
where you live is a pretty vital aspect of that report. Right. So if you are in transition or let's say you're building a home and you live in an apartment, to, you know, for six months, they will do, you need, the home study will be done on your current residence, where you're actually located in that time frame, And then it's, if it's approved, you're good for that time frame. But if you move into a new home, you were supposed to notify your adoption agency to say, I've moved. They have to at least come and physically see your new home and write the, add an, we call it an addendum to your home study. If it's, if it's within the year or whenever it's not expired. And so, yes, you have to get something, just another uh, social worker to come and do a visit. And it's usually a pretty quick update. It doesn't typically right, take right. too long, but you have to be like aware when you're moving, oh, don't forget to call the agency. And we just double check those a lot of times. We'll just read it. I mean, you know, if you've mm -hmm. moved, it's a quick update. So right. there's no personal interviews. Usually those agencies, it's a much lower price. You're not paying for a full home study again. Um, it's really just like a house check, making sure it's safe and mm -hmm. good home. Well, hopefully you have gotten the impression that these ladies are working for you because they they really are when you when you do open adoptions when, when you do open or closed adoptions and have your home study reviewed these ladies are working for you and for the embryos uh and, you know and that's that's what it's all about so hopefully you've, you've gotten that impression and gotten a little bit of a better window into what to expect if you're if you're new to the nedc this is one area of our program that uh, really has been improved uh, so much uh, over the last few years i i can tell you that from firsthand experience I, I know the feedback we get now compared to uh you know at times in the past it's it's so much more positive our nedc families have such terrific experiences with flourish consulting llc which is uh, almost entirely these two ladies lauren and, and amy and uh lauren as we close i think it's important to note that part of the reason for that is you are really very intentional about feedback. You talk to people mm -hmm. after their experiences and you keep that information on record. Um, can you share just some of the, the general numbers and, uh, and the feedback that you have gotten from people and, and how it's helped you all do the job better? Sure. Um, when Flourish came on board, we actually partnered with you all, the NEDC and Dr. Keenan at the time to create and revamp the education of, of all of our incoming recipient couples, because education is so uh, important. You know, a lot of couples mm -hmm. come to embryo adoption not really understanding it. They have just learned about it, and they don't know all the ins and outs of it yet. They're new to it. And so that can be quite overwhelming to not know a lot about it. So the training modules we created, you are, uh, those are part of your requirement when you get a home study review. So you do those training modules and we have a uh, survey there. And what's great, most of the feedback on that survey is people literally just saying, wow, I learned something. I didn't mm -hmm. think about this. Or I, we have a video on there of a child, someone who's an adult and um, was born of a donor conception. And so they were speaking as a, I think she 30 something. And that video always resonates. People will say, mm -hmm. wow, I, I wasn't picturing my child as a 30 year old one day right. yet. Right. And it's, that's why, again, I go back to the voice of the child. We, we want to let these couples know, we want you to be fully informed because this is such an important decision. And this is a unique way to, uh, bring life to these embryos and bring out a child to your family. And we don't take that, that is not a small thing to us. And we want you to feel supported. We want you to feel knowledgeable to make some of these very important decisions. Like, do we choose an open donor? Do we choose an, not? that's a big decision and we don't want to influence anyone. That's your choice. You know, that is your, your future decision for your child. So, yeah, I think the feedback thankfully is mostly positive and, and people feel 
like that's very helpful to them and they feel I hope they all feel supported that is most of the feedback I get is they felt like we were supportive to them and listened mm -hmm. and I think that's uh going through infertility that's all they need sometimes you just want to know someone's caring and listening and and compassionate and understand you've gone, some of these couples have gone through eight years yeah, of a yeah. long difficult road and and we want to make it as smooth and easy of a process, but also fully prepare them so they can be amazing, wonderful, loving parents to their future kids. Yeah. Awesome. Well, we are uh, we are so happy to be partnering with you two, and you know some of those feedback surveys are like at a hundred percent satisfaction. So that speaks very well of the job that you ladies are doing. <laughs> and uh, I think you've done a great service just being with me today, helping people who are just starting to wade into these waters, understand mm -hmm. what's ahead. And of course, we're always here at the NEDC. They're always there at Flourish to talk to as well. If you have some follow-up questions, which some of you uh, indeed may. If you want to find out more about the NEDC, you can go to our website. It's embryodonation.org. Again, embryodonation.org. I'm Mark Mellinger, and this has been the Embryo Adoption Podcast. <laughs>